Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a, a good break, had a coffee, had something to eat and feel good and ready for Laura, uh, no, Lauren, Helen. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so our next speaker is Helen Lauren. She has a very impressive resume, yes. Yeah? So I'm just quickly going to tell you a little bit more about her. She's an independent infection control and prevention practitioner and a clinical risk management nurse specialist. Helen is a registered nurse who undertook her general training in Zimbabwe prior to coming to South Africa in 1979. She has enjoyed a varied and challenging career in healthcare, safety and quality management, nursing education, oncology and advanced wound care in state and in private healthcare facilities, as well as community NGO sectors. Previously a lecturer and a facilitator for the short learning program in infection prevention and control from the University of the Free State. Helen also <coughs> serves on several advisory boards, including the KZN Specialist Network Antimicrobial Stewardship Subcommittee. <laughs> Goodness, <laughs> that's a lot of measures for this African goal. The National Hand Hygiene Excellence Working Group, the SA Bureau of Standards, and the Wound Healing Association of South Africa. Her practice credo, is that the right way to say it? Yes. Okay, yes. Right. <laughs> Protect your patients and empower your people is the foundation of her service and mission to provide support on issues, <coughs> issues relating to patient safety, practice standards, and continuous quality improvement. Customers include all categories of healthcare professionals in hospitals, clinics, community institutions, veterinary practice, and the medical device manufacturing industry. Helen's special <coughs> interests and areas of expertise include strategies for the prevention of healthcare associated infections, drug resistant pathogens in high risk patient populations, antimicrobial stewardship, and complex wound management. Thank you Thank so you, much Danielle. for joining us. We look forward to, to your time Thank you. today. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. I just, uh, you won't see me on TV. This is, anyway, and I'll stay put for the gentleman at the back. Thank you all so much for coming. I come from Durban. I've had an inhuman start this morning that I'm visualizing tea after this madly. But yes, I'm a nurse by background. I've had a wonderful career. And as I say, I've, I've worked in oncology, the long-term care setting, um, geriatrics. Um, I've taught for most of my career. And of course, my passion now is bad bugs, which we don't need any introduction. So although my topic is going to be on pressure injury and risk assessment, I'm afraid I can't help myself. You are going to get some infection control today because it's a very big part of pressure injury and skin integrity management because now your residents and the people that you care for are amongst the highest risk people for infection and drug resistant organisms. So it's all circles within circles. So yes, I, I'm a nurse, I work on my own and as I say, I teach and now I'm coming to the, the end of my my career and I'm, I'm very involved in the development now of antiseptics and hand rubs and quality in medical devices and safety for patients. So things that are actually going to be thing, dressings development, things like that, that they're going to be safe for the patient because obviously this is a multi-million dollar business. So I will touch a little bit on wound management, but mainly principles, which you do need to know about, obviously, in your area of care. But again, I will also touch on some of the drug-resistant um, problems that we are facing and how you can make a difference in your, in your daily work. I will not stop for questions if that's all right for you because the session is being recorded, but I will finish early to allow for some discussion and some interaction. All right. So we should start at the very beginning, the skin. Oh, the skin. Remember that anatomy tutor, the skin, the anatomy of the skin. And you just saw the shutters come down. And the skin has got three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous layer. OK, I'm gone now. I'm gone. <laughs> it's much more than that. 33% of the water in your body is stored in the skin. 
the skin is not only the largest organ in your body, it can weigh up to 20 kilos. I felt so much better when I stood on the scale. Oh, 20 kilos of skin. Relax. Relax. But this is very important, very important information in terms of hydration and the surface area. Because remember, the skin is a metabolic organ and it is an organ of excretion. So it comes into very, very big focus when we're talking about medication and organ failure. Very, very important. I like to think of the skin as a window into the body. And this quote is taken from um, my oncology nursing notes back in the day. And it's such a true word because it is a window into the health of the body. You know when you meet someone new or you see someone you haven't seen after a long time, and besides thinking, oh, he's put on weight or she hasn't aged so well, as nurses, we are scanning them, aren't we? We're scanning them. We don't even know we're doing it. And we do it in two, three seconds. <laughs> and we've taken in their hair, their skin, their wrinkles, the condition of their hands. You know, um, yeah. Oh, what's that purpura? Or, oh, she's not, she's anemic. You know what I'm saying? We're scanning continually. So the skin is a very, very important window into the general health of the body. Because if something is not well in the body, the skin is going to show it. And remember, the hair and the nails are part of the skin as, a, as an organ. There are many, many things that affect the health and well-being of our skin. And it would not be, um, it, it would not be an overreach to say that if your skin is not healthy, you are not healthy. It's very important. So your skin is also a barometer of health. And by keeping your skin healthy, you also keep yourself healthy. And I know this as an infection prevention specialist, because the skin is one of the most important barriers we have for the immune system, from germs, bacteria, viruses, and, and fungi. So the skin is a very, very important barrier, and to keep it healthy. But obviously, aging and gender, you might not have thought that, and I'm so glad we've got so many men here today as well. Aging affects men and women completely differently. And those of us that are a certain age, we know that because we're losing collagen and we're seeing the crow's feet and everything's going south because our ovaries are not working anymore and uh, we're having hot flushes and our husbands are looking better than ever. <laughs> you know why? They have more hair follicles than we have. They've got more hair follicles, they've got more sebaceous glands. If they've got more sebaceous glands, they've got more sebum or oil on their skin. So they don't have to use Nivea. <laughs> you see? So men generally age better than women. Obviously, if you've got an underlying disease or you're you know, chronically ill, your skin will show that. And obviously men you, or anemia and cancer and things like that. But gender is very important when it comes to, to aging and how the skin changes. Another biggie, which is why I've put it second on the list, is the environment we live in. And just stepping off the plane today, I was so aware of how not only the chill, but the dryness coming from KZN. And I know that I only have to spend a few days in Joburg and I have this runny nose and I get a, sore, a cold sore from blowing my nose and dry eyes and, and everything. Whereas in KZN, anyone from KZN here? We sweat. That's no word for it. We just sweat. So the seasons, the time of year, and the level of humidity is very important. And we take air conditioning for granted. But what we call the, um, um, oh, the word escapes me for the moment, but the environment of the skin is very closely related to sweating, humidity, and temperature regulation. You will know that. And it's very important that we monitor the humidity in our long-term care environments. Because those of you that have cared for quadriplegics in particular, and those patients with brainstem injuries will know how diaphoretic they are. Remember that word, 
they're sweaty. They have a particular smell and odor and their skin is greasy. Have you noticed that? Your quadriplegics and your tetraplegics. So they're a whole different story in terms of temperature regulation, skin injury and skin integrity as a good example. Medication, shear forces and pressure, those be no introduction. And then last but not least, and that's why I've tried to make it like a rainbow, going to red for highest risk, is the effect of prolonged exposure to moisture on, on skin or irritants like urine or feces. How many of you care for residents that are ostomates, that have um, colostomy or a urostomy? Any of you? Oh, that skin. That skin takes a battering, doesn't it? So that's why that's red. Let me start with the first and the effect of aging on the skin. And it wasn't until I taught um, an advanced wound care course a few years ago for the European Wound Management Association. And even after all those years of experience, I learned so much from this course. And the first thing that had such an impression on me was this purple, do you see this convoluted line here between the epidermis and the dermis? Do you see that? Does anyone know what that, that ridge is called? Does anyone remember that? It's not a test. But you don't, you, don't, you don't recall that. It's actually vitally important that we, in what we do, we know this. It's called REITS ridges. And REIT is R-E-T-E. -E. I presume that was the name of the man who named them. And the REITS ridges is a physical, geographical barrier between the epidermis and the dermis. Now, another very important to remember, thing to remember is that the epidermis does not have blood vessels in it. It's avascular. Remember that. The epidermis, the outermost layer, is called the stratum corneum. Remember that. And that rubs off in dead, dry skin cells every day. You and I, every time we twitch or move or walk, we shed about five to six million dead cells a day. So when you've got visitors coming round or you're looking at the high dusting and you do this, that's dead skin. And on each one of those dead skin cells is about minimum 10,000 skin bacteria. And they're like little surfboards floating in, in the air currents before they come to, to rest. So ventilation is critically important. Don't shake linen. Don't put linen on the floor. Don't hold linen by your body. It is covered. It, it is full of millions and millions of these dry skin cells that you and I know as the stratum corneum or the horny layer of the skin. There's no blood there. But underneath the epidermis is the dermis. And it's the dermis that supplies the blood, the capillaries, the nerve endings, the oxygen and the nutrients to the epidermis. But in between is this, what we call REITS ridges, this purple convoluted area. Now, when you're young, it's very, very convoluted. What do you think the physiology or the purpose behind something that's convoluted like that? What does it increase? Oxygen. Surface area. Yes, surface area. So if you were to take this piece of Reed's ridges and stretch it out in a straight line, if that's a 10 centimeter wedge of skin that you've cut out of somebody, if you were to stretch that purple line there, would it be longer than 10 centimeters? Yes. So nature is so intelligent. Those Reed's ridges are increasing the surface area of providing blood and oxygen and nutrients to the epidermis when we're young. But as we age, the epidermis gets thinner. Do you see that? Because we don't make collagen 
as fast or as well as we used to. And that's where the wrinkles come from and the sagging. And when you bump yourself and you don't even remember, and the next day you see this big purple bruise and you think, what did I do to myself? That is where you have literally torn the capillaries in the dermis because you don't have enough collagen <coughs> in this area of the Reitz ridges to cushion against bumps and injuries. So when you get older, the epidermis, the top layer of the skin, not only gets thinner and drier and obviously much more fragile, what's happened to those Reitz ridges? They've gone flat. Do you see that? So you don't have the surface area that you had before of oxygen and nutrients and blood supply. That for me, that is critically important in an aging skin. So this photo demonstrates what we see on the outside, but this is actually what's going on on the inside, which will make you that much more aware if you leave someone in a position for too long. You don't have the cushioning, you don't have the collagen, and you certainly do not have the blood supply and the oxygen. Again, nature is so intelligent. I talked about all the hair follicles that men have and the sebaceous glands that make the oil that comes out of our hair follicles. And those of us with teenagers or have suffered acne know that that sebum was the bane of our lives, wasn't it? That oily skin. And we tried every lotion and potion available to reduce this sebum barrier that's on the epidermis to make it less greasy. The problem is, as we age, the sebum or the activity of our sebaceous glands in our hair follicles becomes less. Everything is less. So our skin becomes drier, and that is why you're so itchy in winter. And this is why you'll see in your elderly re residents, they go bonkers trying to scratch their backs. Just can't get to that, that spot. So itching and trauma and scratching is a very big issue when your sebaceous glands are not that active as you age. And if you have an organ disease, such as liver failure or kidney failure, your skin will also be dry. So it will be further complicated if you've got kidney or liver disease. So this sebum barrier is a very, very important waterproof protectant barrier that you and I are not aware of. But we do know is that our skin is most receptive to emollients and moisturizers immediately after we've washed it. Isn't that right? So the best time to apply your cream is after you've had a bath or a shower or after you've washed your resident. That's when the epidermis is most receptive. And don't believe Longcom and all these fancy people about things going through to the dermis. That is a lot of hooey. These things cannot penetrate the dermis because of the wreath ridges. That's a physical and geographical barrier. So it's all about all our lotions and potions that we put on are merely to hydrate the epidermis, the layer of the epidermis that's under the horny layer. Are you with me? And it's most receptive when it's moist. The problem is, is when moisture is there for a prolonged time and where there's irritants or chemicals or enzymes, say from feces or urine, what it does is it breaks down this, this barrier. And it's only from a very sophisticated interaction between the waste product, three things. The waste products of bacteria, which sounds gross, but that's the skin. The skin is covered in trillions of microbes and in your hair follicles in particular. So after you've washed your hands for, for infection control or applied alcohol hand gel, that's fine. But the bacteria climb out of the little hair follicles back onto the skin and recolonize the skin within 12 to 15 minutes. You're back to square one. That's why you mustn't overwash your hands. It's much better to use hand gel or ha alcohol hand rub frequently. All right, because there are protective emollients in there that will look after the sebum barrier of your skin. It's when you're washing your hands with soap and water continually that you actually will damage that. So getting back to the three things that create this very, very special barrier on the epidermis, 
It's waste products of bacteria, sweat, and the, and the sebum from the sebaceous glands. And together, that makes what we call the acidic mantle of the skin. Have you heard that term? So your skin is naturally slightly acidic. You've heard that in the Johnson & Johnson advert. So please note, if I'm talking trade names, it's not an endorsement, it's an example, so that you can relate you know, to your everyday life. Because the skin is an organ of life. It is with us right to the end. And if it's not healthy and we can't look after our resident skin, we're going to be in, in big trouble. So this acidic nature of the skin is very, very important to prevent from infection and to prevent skin breakdown. So people always say to me, Helen, what should I be looking for in a body wash? I said, you should be looking not for um, almond milk or whatever. The magic word is pH balanced so that you know that that skin wash, or if it's something that you're using for your residents that are incontinent, it is balanced with the pH of the skin in the sense that it will be between four and a half and seven neutral. And it will keep all the good bacteria on the skin healthy. That, that is immensely important. So there you go, there's your sebum, and it is moisturizing this horny layer of the skin. But if you have constant exposure to irritating chemicals or urine or feces or on the other end of the scale dryness, it will affect the, the body's formation of these natural moisturizing factors. So very, very important to keep the skin hydrated and well moisturized. Um, I don't want to digress because of time. And I will be going later in my presentation into a clinical guideline that has just recently been published in about 2020 and enormously practical in terms of the kind of emollients that you should be using on your own skin, let alone your residents. And things like aqueous cream are absolutely hopeless and useless. And we use them all the time, but they're water-based. They're not going to do anything for that sebaceous protective layer. So, yeah, so that's another important word. You need to look at oils and the word emollient and humectant. So those of you that are into diabetic care as well will know that if you've got a body lotion that has urea added to it, you want a urea content of between three and 5% in that lotion. Urea, just like the kidneys filter, is a humectant and it draws moisture and helps create these natural moisturizing factors that I was talking about that create this barrier on the epidermis. So urea is a very important ingredient in skin lotions in patients that require pressure area care and incontinence care and diabetes care. Medication, my goodness, I don't think there's one medication that actually does not affect the body and obviously the skin as an organ. Um, as I mentioned, my presentation will be available to you for teaching purposes. So as I say, you can concentrate. You don't have to, if you would like to take a photo, you're very welcome. But I've tried to compile my slides in such a way is that you can use them individually so you can print them off and you can put them on a notice board or a teaching board, or you can use them for a teachable moment and you can laminate them. All right. I just ask that you do not change the presentation anyway and do not remove any of the references because remember this is copyright material and we must credit all the people that go before us that, that whose knowledge I am now using to, to teach you. That's very important. But all my references are at the back if you want more information. But the two biggies are the, well, three biggies really, is your cortisone, um, corticosteroid agents like prednisone or hydrocortisone and of course those are miracle drugs and have a very wide area of usage from everything from emphysema to asthma to to dermatitis to you know you name it but they have very very serious effects on the skin integrity and strength the thinning of the of the epidermis and the wreath ridges the other one is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And I just want to take a minute to talk about these. 
We have created a world where we can take a tablet for every pain and every ill. And it is advertised on the TV at 7 o'clock at night when the children and the mothers are watching. And every mother wants to be the best mother, and, she, and husbands make terrible patients. So, Steve's saying. So, we need something that treats the 10 most common pains from headache to menstrual pain to arthritis pain. And what are they advertising? Non steroidal anti inflammatory agents. And again, this has nothing to do with the brand. Please, this is not an endorsement or criticism, but two common ones that we use every day in our lives and we don't even think about it, is Voltaren or Brufen. How many of your residents are on those drugs? They rely on those drugs for quality of life, to be able to move and to be pain free. I, for one, I have rheumatoid arthritis, so I know about steroids and I know about the effect on the skin. But you want to live your life and you want to be free of pain. But these drugs have significant effects on the skin, on the thinning of the skin, on the stickiness of our platelets or our clotting cells. Our platelets are normally sticky. They clump together to form what? A clot. So bleeding stops. Have you noticed in those residents that have a slip or a fall and get a skin tear or a laceration of the scalp? How those wounds bleed and bleed and bleed. It's because of the medication, because it's stopping them from forming clots. So even the most minor bump can result in devastating injury. And if your patient has an existing wound like a leg ulcer or a diabetic foot <coughs> ulcer or a pressure ulcer, you must know that these drugs delay healing hugely. Um, you are fighting a losing battle. This is the back of a, of a patient's head or a resident's head. Can you see that? You can see that that pressure injury has been there for a very long time because the body's natural protective mechanism is to cover it with slough because slough is a protective covering. And of course, parts of that slough is deeper in certain areas where it's become brown or black. And we call that slough eschar. Remember that. But we all know that pressure applied to a bony provenance where there's no padding underneath and no subcutane, little to no subcutaneous tissue is going to result in, in skin death. Because remember the epidermis has no, it gets its blood supply from the dermis. I've already talked about this. So there's your um, prolonged exposure to, to moisture. Here, this is a venous leg ulcer. Do you see the white rim around this wound? That is called maceration. Exactly the same as you get if you've been in the swimming pool or the bath too long. That is where ex prolonged exposure to moisture has broken through that waterproof sebum barrier. So the sebum barrier has gone. There's no sebum barrier on this skin. This skin is so fragile, it's just not true. The other thing is this wound is overgranulating. Can you see how pink and exuberant it is? So you can see that this is a very moist wound. And it's the wound exudate or the wound fluid that they're not changing the dressing often enough, are they? And that's why you're getting this maceration around the edges. But instead, what we do, we concentrate only on the wound care. We don't give care to this, what we call the peri-wound skin. I cannot tell you how important it is to gently cleanse with a pH-based cleanser. Your antiseptic hand wash that you use for hand washing is a good one, but you need to allocate a bottle to your resident. Do not take the bottle from the sink because then you will contaminate it. All right? So... A common brand would be Hebe Scrub or, you know, your, your Chlorhexidine hand washes. Some of you, um, give me some examples of brands of hand washes you use. Doesn't matter. But remember, what's important is the pH. Go back now, speak to your manufacturer and your supplier. The material safety data sheet must be supplied to you by law. 
check the pH of that hand washing um, liquid that you are using, as well as your alcohol hand rub, and ensure that it is acidic or neutral at most. On the other hand, here's your excoriation from urine and feces. That doesn't take any, and this is what happens to the skin around stomas. Very, very painful situation. The sebum barrier is gone. Something that I thought I must include, and that is skin changes at life's end. How many are you familiar with, with this? Can I see a show of hands? People who haven't heard of scale or skin changes. Don't be afraid. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Who hasn't heard of scale? <clears throat> okay, this is great. Because at least I know you're going to go out with something today that you're thinking, oh, you know, I better look at that. This is not nursing negligence. This is not something that you sue a facility over. This is manifested or takes place over a matter of hours to 24 hours in someone who is approaching death. And from a nursing perspective, it's very important that we as healthcare professionals see this and identify it correctly. Yes, it is a type of pressure ulcer, but it is associated with the terminal phase. And how it presents is as a, and is most commonly on the buttocks, obviously, because by that time the patient is lying flat and their, their oxygen levels are low in their body, their organs are shutting down, they're getting organ failure, and it mass manifests as a very clear butterfly-shaped <coughs> purple mark across the sacrum and the buttocks. And it can be there, it wasn't there the last time that you did pressure area, the next time you go there there's this big purple butterfly and you get the fright of your life. This patient is bleeding into their tissues. They're in organ, end stage organ failure. So the most important thing when you see something like this, it gallops, it progresses fast. And what happens is you'll see here just within the space of overnight, the skin separates from the dermis and then you can even get black eschar after about 24 hours. So now is the time. Offloading is your number one priority in these patients and putting them on an intelligent interactive surface. That is your priority in these patients. And the other thing is to prepare the family because they might not have known that death was so imminent. This might even take you by surprise and we've all been there. So just know this is known as a Kennedy terminal ulcer. And you don't initiate fancy treatment, no fancy dressings. You just, it's just like a silicon dressing or a foam dressing. If you're in a low resource setting, just a plain gauze dressing. But you cannot use strapping on these patients because it is so, so fragile. Very, very difficult. So then um, you might need to... Um, You've got to weigh up the risk of um, sheer forces on a patient like this. That's why it's so important to put them on an interactive surface where you don't have to move them so much, where death is imminent. It's also another indication for urinary catheterization. It's one of the few indications, not incontinence, but terminal phase, so that you're not, the patient is not lying in urine and they're not having to move them when they are terminal and they can't breathe. So this, this um, must be an important signal to you. Let's get into risk management itself. And the buzzwords now, we talk about care bundles and we talk about toolkits. Are these words that you're hearing? How many of you are familiar with the word care bundle? Again, don't be afraid to say no. <clears throat> the word care bundle is coming across from the acute hospital sector. And did you know where it came from before that? The aeronautical industry to stop plane crashes. And um, they operate with what they call bundles or checklists before they take off on an aeroplane. And it's an all or none concept the pilot and his co-pilot with the control tower. 
We have now introduced these in 2004 in South Africa into healthcare, generally in the world actually, since 2004. And the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is a non-denominational quality improvement body that is responsible for this. So the IHR has a wonderful website and you can download amazing protocols and care bundles from there, from everything from preventing medication injuries, pressure ulcers, slips and falls, etc. And it's all free. Absolutely fantastic website, all about quality improvement uh, for every phase of, of life, best practice. So a care bundle is a grouping of best practice, best practices. When we do something in nursing, like we clean a patient's mouth, we know that that's good practice. But we also know if we, if we keep their mouth clean and we keep it moist, and we look after their skin and their hair and we keep them moving and we prevent injury. Together, all those actions are much more powerful than just doing mouth care on its own. Are you with me? So you compile these things called care bundles. Ideally, they shouldn't contain more than five nursing actions. A care bundle is not the same as a protocol or a procedure. A protocol or a procedure is a more detailed document with step by step of how to do something. All right. A care bundle or a toolkit identifies four or five or maybe six things that have got to become your and my act daily activities of daily living. That's how I like to think of it, like we do for our residents. So I'm going to give you some examples. The first is skin risk assessment, tissue assessment, and then lastly, mobility uh, assessment. And I'm going to go into each of those. Skin assessment and a risk assessment are different. A skin incorporates tissue as well and the skin integrity, whereas a risk assessment is a document that gives us a numerical value for how potential, how potentially serious the risk or the hazard is. Are you with me? Okay, but again, th these concepts, they must be multidisciplinary. So we need to work with physios, biokinet biokineticists, social workers, nurses, you name it, all right? And we have to work with the family. Who knows the resident better than the primary carers? Must be multidisciplinary to be valuable. And of course, multi-dimensional, because every, no two people are the same. And that's where we run into problem with risk assessments, and I'm going to show you just now, there's no perfect risk assessment, because everybody is different. There's, the minute you start applying the same risk assessment tool, like the Braden scale, or the Waterloo scale, to everybody, you're trying to fit a one-size-fit caftan. Is that going to work well? No. It's not. So at the end of the day, what we're starting to understand is you need to make your own instruments. And I'm going to show you how this is done. And of course, it must be customized or individualized for every person. And the other thing that we have now starting to adopt in healthcare is this care bundle of actions that we monitor or measure ourselves using checklists. And as I say, we got this from the aeronautical industry. Because, God forbid, but do you know that in South Africa, the number of people who acquire healthcare associated infections or die as a result of healthcare associated adverse events is equivalent to a jumbo 727 crashing every day. So, this is sepsis from pressure ulcers drug-resistant urinary infections, ventilator, pneumonia, etc. Wound infection, caesarean section infection. Um, yesterday was World Sepsis Day. Jumbo jet going down every day. But do jumbo jets go down every day? No, because they've now identified that there are core weaknesses that they must check themselves. And it's all or not. So if you've got a checklist in your care bundle, say for um, keeping patients moving, 
um, or let me just think of, or say, how many of you are caring for patients with bladder catheters? Any of you? Not many. Um, anyway, you, you know what I'm trying to say. You identify four or five things that you must do to prevent complications with this. Press, pressure area care is probably the best. If your patient is incontinent of urinal stool and they're in a nappy, and you go to do pressure area, move them, change their position, etc. And you change the nappy, you move the change the position, but you don't wash the skin after they've been incontinent. And that's washing the skin with a pH balanced wash lotion is one of your checks. Do you give yourself 80% or do you give yourself naught? Naught. If one criterion or element of your care bundle is not done, you get naught. And I work in the hospitals with the ICUs where they are measuring their performance. The private hospitals, oh, they're big on this. They audit 10 files every week randomly, and they look at catheterized patients, ventilated patients, patients going to theater, how many were shaved versus how many were clipped. You don't shave before you go to theater anymore. No more razors because we know that's going to increase your risk of wound infection. So we have these little care bundles to prevent these kind of adverse events. If any one of those actions is missing, you get naught. And this is how I recommend you start making yourself your, your protocols and your care bundles that are specific to your area of care. So they're much more, more accurate. And they must be done for every patient, every day, every time and they must be documented in other words they must stand up legally all right it's, there must be evidence unfortunately for us the skin is not glamorous and what what you do is not perceived as glamorous people have don't they have no idea what you do every day <coughs> it's not until they have to look after someone they suddenly understand so it really, it really is Cinderella work. And it's a huge responsibility that you carry knowing that things are stacked against you because the person is elderly or has lots of comorbidities or neurological disease, etc. So when you carry out risk assessment, it needs to be done after training and lifelong training. You don't just train in risk assessment and leave it there. It is a requirement of the Occupational Health and Safety Act in every country in the world that you must have documented training for every staff member from your cleaning crew right up to the charge sister to the manager on infection control. That, so that would include hand, hand hygiene and cleaning and so forth. Lifting and handling because of workman's compensation. Um, um, and then things that are relevant to your area of speciality. So by law, if, the, if an in inspector was to come from the Department of Labor, they would actually look for evidence that you've done training for every category of staff that is caring for residents in lifting and handling, pressure area management, do you have a policy, etc., and that you have proof of this training. Can you ask yourself that? And do you have a policy that all new staff are trained in this according to their level of you know, um, qualification? The other thing is risk assessment cannot wait till the next day. It must be done within hours of admission and it must be redone if the residence condition changes. Very important. But what do we do? We take the Braden scale or the Waterloo scale and what do we do? We just copy it from the day before. It's human nature. Helen, could I ask, yes, Steve. Could you ask who is doing risk assessment for pressure injury currently from our audience? Yeah. Anybody got a pressure injury document or form that you use, that you add up? <coughs> okay, can we see by a show of hands? In a later slide, we're going to come back to this point now to find out which of these tools you might be using and how you can improve on this. 
there are things that we that are under under our control with our residents and there are things that aren't there are many many things that are outside of our control and these are coming from within the resident and we call these intrinsic factors and i've just listed some of them there for you that need no no introduction all right obviously age dehydration low sodium dementia um, other neurological conditions um, organ failure chronic kidney disease cardiac failure all right those things are not under our control but we can manage the environment under which we look after these and most important and edema edema is such an enemy to us because edema disrupts the epidermis from the dermis and the reeds ridges so the skin is very very fragile as you know when you've got edema and then when you've got edema that you don't treat that doesn't respond to elevation anymore we call that lymphedema and that's irreversible and that's a very serious state of affairs but i just put in here infection please show me by a show of hands how many of you test the urine of a new resident when they come a dipstick just a dipstick okay and how often do you routinely check their urine so you have a system weekly or monthly and obviously if they're symptomatic or you can smell it then you all right good good i cannot tell you how important this is this has got everything to do with skin integrity and it has everything to do with infection control and patient safety <coughs> patients are a terrific risk of urinary tract infection and unfortunately they go into hospital for a fairly straightforward procedure and they come out with a pressure ulcer or a skin tear and a drug resistant uti yeah that's the reality so your residents are very very high risk so checking the urine is very very important for drug resistant organisms and for chronic urinary infection because that will cause skin breakdown um, very very quickly these are some of the things that you and i can can influence that injury there was caused by a nurse's ring all right that's see that injury there so this patient has already got excoriation from urine and stool so the skin is already compromised the sebum or the sebaceous barrier is gone and then they've just gone like this with a ring and they've injured this obviously is a combination of a stage 2 pressure ulcer with quite severe um, maceration and excoriation so the extent of this wound is not just these three islands it's this whole area because the sebum barrier is gone on that skin that skin is completely nude and you will find that the ph is very alkaline and you will find that the bacterial levels are very very high in fecals like streptococcus streptococcus faecalis and e coli does that ring a bell to some of you poo bacteria yeah this is a fantastic photo this little lady had an oxygen mask and was positioned on her side beautiful pressure care turning left to right left to right the chart and the elastic was lying over her and over her ear on the pillow and that happened overnight yeah so that is a device related pressure injury so nasal oxygen prongs and oxygen and elastic yeah and you'll see pressure ulcers or pressure injuries so even patient spectacles do you see it on the bridge of the nose yeah and then last but not least that pressure injury is being caused by a urinary catheter yeah so don't forget about device related injuries that we think nothing of of using um pig sites uh, stoma bags etc the influence of shear and drag forces and friction very very um um serious and destructive fluids and then you and i come in here with our lifting and handling and we're short staffed and we're in a hurry and we just have to to drag if you think years ago all our all our healthcare linen was cotton but it was laundered at high temperatures and it was ironed in huge ironing machines 
Now everything is polyester, isn't it? So it's minimal ironing, doesn't crease, and it dries quickly. It is very bad for skin, very bad for friction and shear and moisture, polyester. And we just know that from our clothing, don't we? And our patients are continually in contact with it, be it the bed linen or the clothing. And then we change their position and we're not paying attention and the elastic or the arm seam is cutting, cutting into them. The seating, I don't know about you, there's these coffee shops have got these metal, metal chairs that have got like three, and they hurt. Do you know those coffee, those coffee shops with metal chairs? <coughs> they hurt. They press, they press into you. They're obviously cheap and unbreakable. <laughs> and then, so as we said, inappropriate seating, clothing, and obviously medication and poor hygiene. How's my pace? Am I going too fast? No. Too slow? No. And the terminology is all right? Yes. Oh yes, plenty. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Let's just start with skin and tissue assessment. Let's start at the very beginning, as we said, the skin. And these are the main things that we'll do, be scanning, won't we? We'll be looking at the color, pigmentation. Pigmentation is a huge problem in our black patients, being able to notice early pressure injury and um, bruising. Very, very difficult. Whereas in your little old ladies, it's very easy to, to see. So this takes special training and, and experience. Please don't examine patients with gloves on. We are, we are creating a huge issue for ourselves. Just to digress for a moment, we've all been trained to use standard precautions. This is the Occupational Health and Safety Act again. Thou shalt wear gloves and plastic or impermeable barrier aprons or visors if we anticipate contact with blood, stool, urine, and body fluids and wound fluids. Isn't that right? But if you're lifting and moving a patient or doing a skin assessment or feeding a patient or making their bed, we do not need to wear gloves. We are spreading multi-drug resistant organisms on gloves and we are hurting our own skin by constantly exposing our stratum corneum to the inside of gloves. It is an occupational risk. And then we are touching all our environmental surfaces with gloves that are filthy things. So please do not touch patients with gloves on. If you're changing a nappy, a patient's been incontinent, if you are bathing a patient in bed or in the bath, you will don gloves to wash their genitalia. You're not doing that because they repulse you. You're doing that as a sign of respect. I would want the nurse or the carer to, who's washing my private areas with gloves. Have you thought about it from that angle? The patient or the resident thinks they are repulsed by me. They see the gloves. That's what they see. So gloves is, is standard precautions and it's only for contact with body fluids and wound fluids. All right. Or if you are obviously handling the, the genitalia. But for me, it's even more a mark of respect. And never leave the bedside wearing gloves. Dispose of them and perform hand hygiene the minute you remove your gloves. And then we're looking classic skin tears very difficult in, in, our, in our black patients, pigmented patients. If you are unable to put the skin back quickly and stem the bleeding, you're going to have to cut off that skin aseptically because it will die and you'll get an infection. So don't leave it in, in place. And then obviously look at that, look at that abrasion, that sheer friction and sheer forces, that, that injury that might be evident of slips and falls and poor lifting and handling techniques. Now, I've already explained to you about the tissue destruction pathway. Just the simple pressure on capillaries and venules cuts off the circulation from the dermis to the epidermis. And it happens at a very, very low pressure. 
But this slide, this picture says it all, the iceberg. So what you and I can see on top is only a tiny fraction of what is going on underneath. Huge. So this is what you and I are seeing in our skin and tissue assessment, but this is what's going on in the patient's body. And we all know that these are the common areas of the body that are very, you know, um, subject to injury and, and pressure injury and so forth. I cannot emphasize enough. It's not enough to put your patient on, in terms of a surface, if your patient is immobile or incontinent, or got any sort, of, any sort of mobility issues. And remember, confused patients and fidgety patients are at more risk of friction and shear damage to the skin than pressure is. You know that. It's very important if your patient has mobility issues and they're unable to change their position, and we change our position unconsciously when we're sleeping at night, is it 11, every 11 minutes? I believe that's the figure, yeah. About every 11 minutes we change our position unconsciously. Now you're just scratching there and you're just moving. and You're not even thinking about it, are you? No. It's very, very important. It is not enough to place a patient on something like an egg box or these gel pads because they are not what we call interactive surfaces. Now, today, for example, Arjo, who's sponsoring this learning day, those are advanced medical devices that you're seeing out there after years and years of physiology research, measuring the pressure in capillaries and cutoff pressures, and how much a body weighs at the back of the head versus the, the heel on the mattress versus the sacrum. What someone with a BMI of 30 what pressure are they exerting on their bed surface versus someone who is, is um, you know, skeletal, for example. So we talk about an active support service. We also talk about interactive or intelligent surfaces. But these are surfaces that are continually intelligently monitoring what we call the cone effect. And I'm going to show that on the next slide. The cone effect occurs, sorry, just going to look at that, areas where you've got a bony prominence <coughs> under the skin, you're automatically going to have an area of high pressure. Do you see the red there? This is, this is an infrared scanner. This is the same patient who is on an interactive support surface. Do you see the red and the orange and the yellow has disappeared completely? Because this intelligent surface is monitoring the pressures in the arterioles and the capillaries and the veins on each pressure point that is in contact with that surface. It is so intelligent. So what you and I just refer to as a ripple mattress, just very casually every day, is a, is a, is a, is a work of art. Because the pressure in each one of those cells is different across different parts of the, the body. I included this photo. How many of you have seen these tear-shaped or elliptical injuries? That is a dead giveaway of poor lifting and handling. Tear-shaped injuries like that on the hip, on the greater trochanter. Yeah. See the tear shape? It shows drag, drag forces. Tear giveaway. And then, of course, when we talk about friction and shear, this is a completely different type of physics to pressure. Here we're talking about lateral forces that are working on the epidermis. And that is why I stress the Reitz ridges to you and the lack of collagen as we age, because there isn't that cushioning there anymore. So the capillaries are very, very close to the, the epidermis. There isn't any padding. And if, you're, if, a, if a patient is, is very thin or it's a bony prominence, this actually refers to the kinking or the literal tearing of the blood vessels. And that's what that purpura is. Did you, try again? <coughs> you are at your destination. 
So that purpura that you see, those big purple bruises, is where the capillaries literally have been torn and they've bled into the tissues. You all know that there is staging to pressure injuries and we, there, are, there are roughly four, there are actually five. There's a fifth I'm going to show you. But this is one that we see commonly, but very easy to see in white residents. Not so easy in your pigmented residents. And this is your commonly known as the tenting effect. And it's where you get that initial erythema. It's actually becoming an issue now in midwifery, did you know that? Because we're administering so many caesarean sections and spinal anesthesia that our patients are getting healed like this in midwifery. Who would have thought? Medical legal hazard. Yep. As I say, we talk about the interface pressure. How many of you have got residents where you help them put on compression stockings for lower, lower leg edema or for leg, leg ulcers? The average pressure in mercury of a compression stocking is between 30 and 36 millimeters of mercury. Just that pressure, the same pressure of that compression stocking that your patient or your resident is in all day, that's how long, that's all it takes to cut off the blood supply to a pressure point. Yeah, it's 30, 32 millimeters to an arterial or a capillary. A vein is even lower, it's only 12, because there isn't as much blood pressure in the veins is there, as there in the arteries. So the pressure at which your, your, your arterials and your arterial system close down is not very, not very high at all. And that is why these interactive surfaces, such as the, the, um, the beds that you're seeing demonstrated out in the demonstration hall, they are monitoring these, they're monitoring this continually and shifting it. So the pressure at each cell of those mattresses is changing from when the patient is on their back to when they're on their side to when they're seated on their buttocks, for example. And then the same would go for wheelchairs and other, you know, mobility equipment. So it's highly intelligent and it's all based on the physiology of the blood pressure in the blood vessels. Stage two pressure injury, the skin is gone, but it can present as a blister as well. Okay, so a blister is a stage two because it's disrupted from the, the dermis. Don't use pressure injury staging to describe skin tears or maceration or excoriation from urine and stool. That is moisture associated skin damage. Have you heard of that? MASD. There is a separate um, classification for that. I'm going to show you where you can find it. Stage three, which we've already talked about. Slough is a completely normal physiological protective uh, response and is not necessarily a bad thing. So don't try and debride every, every wound you, you come across. And then of course stage four or full thickness. I know that's not nice before lunch. <laughs> but this is where you've got full thickness tissue destruction and you're down to muscle, fascia and bone. All right, you all know this. That's a heel. Yeah. There you've got a combination of skin injury there. Do you see that? And in this wound, you've got a very interesting combination. You see you've got undermining of the wound here. You all know what undermining is. So the wound is extending underneath the skin here. All right? Sorry. Can I see stage So that is where you're down, you're down to the, the dermis. Okay, underlying tissue, sometimes muscle. But these, I've shown these photos because there's not much underlying tissue. So they're very easy to diagnose in stage four. Now there is another stage that has recently been introduced from about 2016 and that is the unstageable pressure injury. This is very important. 
You cannot stage this because this is what we call stable Ishar. This is your this is your iceberg personified. You cannot see what's going on underneath there. Please do not rush with moist dressings and hydrocolloid dressings to soften this up to try and remove it. Your patient will die of septicemia because underneath there are all anaerobic bacteria. Do you see the cellulitis here? Do you see the inflammation? That infection is going down to the bone. These kind of wounds have to be managed conservatively. So if you get a, a dry eschar on a heel, for example, in a diabetic patient, your primary objective is offloading. Offloading and protection. Not necessarily to cover it, other than in a protective or a cushioning dressing. But unfortunately, a lot of the foam dressings that are sold now for heels and elbows, they're stuck on and then nobody <coughs> looks underneath them. And then what happens is you get a high level of humidity underneath these dressings. Nature follows its course and this softens and breaks down. And what happens is the bacteria do the rest. And before you know it, you have necrotizing fasciitis. You've heard of that? Also known as flesh-eating disease. And that is literally what is going on in your stage four pressure ulcers. These patients, these are not healable wounds. And I'm sorry, but we, we have responsibility in our care sector to be able to differentiate between healable and non-healable wounds. So this management is purely conservative. Check that they don't have a urinary infection because that can be the most common cause of a pressure ulcer or a wound suddenly deteriorating and getting deeper. UTI is a very common cause. But these kind of cases, if your patient is mobile and they've got some level of mobility, you want to conserve that. You don't want to stick them in a bed or a wheelchair. You, you need to get a vascular assessment for that patient before you take off this this um, slough or Esha. All right. This kind of thing needs intravenous antibiotics and theatre. It's not something that you would address in a long term setting. But with respect, the companies that make dressings would have you believe different. <coughs> They'll want you to put dressings and to de slough this and granulate it. And meanwhile, your resident is 93, chronic renal failure, and um, what is more important, quality of life? Or, or healing. It's not a healable wound. So when you're looking at dressings, one of the most important things that you need to think about are, is managing the moisture in the wound. So whether it's a leg ulcer or a pressure ulcer, make sure that your dressing is thirsty enough. And the minute your dressing is saturated, it must be changed. The minute you see strike through on the ceiling of the dressing, do you all know what I mean by strike through? Evidence of the exudate, that dressing is no longer coping. It needs to be removed. And again, this is a medical legal hazard. You're now being supplied with silver and other similar antimicrobial dressings that you're told you can leave in place for five to seven days. That is nonsense. You change the dressing when the dressing is wet. The minute it leaks, the minute you see strike through, that dressing can no longer accommodate. All right. This is a financial thing that you're being told. All right. It is not in the best interest of the resident and certainly not in terms of infection control. All right. So you'll be familiar with foam dressings. They're very, very commonly used on pressure ulcers. I'm not a big fan of foam dressings because of biofilm. Um, and because they are occlusive, they cut out the oxygen. Um, alginates, how many of you are using alginates? These are seaweed dressings. Very safe, very good. Available plain alginate, or you can get medicated alginate with silver in, for example. Please do not overuse silver dressings. We're now starting to see resistance to silver in bacteria, which is very, very serious. And silver is, is all we have. And please, please do not use antibiotics on wounds. That is a big part of my work with the stewardship program. 
all right? Never, ever apply antibiotics to wounds. And it's beyond the scope of this talk, but we could have a workshop on crushing flagell or, um, you know, or, or silver sand, et cetera, yeah. So please speak, speak to an infection preventionist. And then you've got your super absorbent dressings, which are very similar to your nappies. They're made of um, cellulose. So those are your three pillars of wound management and pressure ulcer management. Manage the moisture, whether it's on the skin around the wound and coming from the wound itself. Keep dead tissue to a minimum. But if it's that dry black eschar that's on a heel or a sacrum, you need to get a surgeon's um, input. You don't just start putting dressings on there and trying to soften it up by auto, you know, autologous uh, debridement. And then infection control. So I've already spoken about risk assessment. Risk assessment is a tool or a document or an instrument that has numbers and criteria on it. And we select the numbers and the criteria that best relate to our resident. Isn't that right? A risk assessment of any form has two main themes running through it. The one is the magnitude of the potential injury. Another word for saying this is what's the worst case scenario if this was to happen. So in this case, we're talking about pressure injury what would be the worst case scenario if the skin was to break in this particular resident? The second theme is how likely is this to happen in this resident? And we call this the probability. Those elements must be present in a risk assessment. The problem is, is that we're too we try and fit ourselves into these criteria, don't we? We're trying to make our resident fit into that, and that's where the problem begins. Don't let it conflict with your clinical judgment. If you think something more is going on here, put that risk assessment tool to the side and rather um, get somebody else in to assess that patient. These are just some of the very well-known risk assessment tools. Do some of these look familiar to you? And you're probably using some of these. How many of you are using the Braden scale? Very popular. Um, Waterloo? Norton? <coughs> these were all very, very good in their day. They were like someone had switched the light on in the room. They were enormous help to us. But the thing is, our knowledge has come so far now with skin integrity and interactive services and physiology of skin health that we realize that we can't fit the patient into one, one checklist. And all of these have got problems. So then we start, we do research and we look at how specific a risk assessment is and how sensitive it is to that particular human being that we're using it on. Remember I said there's no one size fits all. Just look here, this was a big Cochrane review that was done way back in 2005. It's a fascinating document. They looked at the Braden scale in a frail aged nursing home in the UK and they looked at the criteria and they looked, they compared the residents that were in there at the time. It was only 46% accurate. It was only accurate for 46% of their residents, less than half of their residents. By the same token, it was, you wanted to be specific to your area of care. So if you're in dementia care, there's no good using a risk assessment. No, let me rephrase this. Let's just say that you are looking after a, a paraplegic, someone who can ably transfer from bed to chair, and they've got a colostomy and a urostomy, and they're completely self-caring, the mobility is the issue. Would it be suitable to try and use something like um, the Braden scale on this, on this resident? It wouldn't be, wouldn't be appropriate, because the origin of the risk <laughs> Is, is completely different. You must individualize it. Look at this one. They took the Norton scale, again in a frail aged room, been around since 1962, one that we've all used and we rely on. 
it was only sensitive in 63% of cases. This one that's used in orthopedics was only accurate in 30% of cases. So it shows up that there's no perfect risk assessment tool. The best thing is to take all of those and look at your area of long-term care and what your speciality is. And take the, the, the criteria or the elements of risk that relate to those residents and compile your own risk assessment instrument. That's what I would recommend. And keep it very simple, like on a scale of one to four or one to five. And obviously the higher the number, the higher the risk. And there's your probability and your worst case scenario. The problem is, is that we don't do training on our risk assessment tools. Now, those of you that are using risk assessment tools, have you done training of your staff? <coughs> sort of on the, at the bedside as you go, all right. Have you documented it? Is there, is there a test? No. How can, how can you evaluate the level of learning? Yeah. <laughs> this, I wish I could have had this 40 years ago. This is such a clever little tool. And you saw in the video at the beginning of our day, we can relate because this humanizes our residents. And we can, in every single one of these characters, we can see a resident. And straight away, we can see what the challenges are in terms of risk, can't we? Both in terms of worst case scenario and probability. So it would not be appropriate to use the Braden or the Norton scale. Is it on Eric, I think? Uh, it, Albert. Albert, in your, in your folder. Versus this, this little lady who never leaves her bed <coughs> and has no, you know, she's got contractures and, and so forth. I, this chap resonates with me a lot, especially coming from KZN and the amount of diabetics we have. We have patients scooting around in their wheelchairs with one leg. And then this leg is a below and above knee amputation. How often do you see that? And they're scooting around using the one, the one leg. Those patients have very special needs. So just to conclude, these are the questions that I'd like you to ask yourself coming out of, out of my session today. Does your facility have a written policy that is evident to the public, to your residents and their families and their loved ones, about your commitment to the prevention and minimization of adverse events per se? In this instance, it would be pressure area management and pressure injury prevention. But you could have a statement that say, we are committed to remaining abreast of and in, um, implementing best practice to minimize the occurrence and the severity of things like slips and falls, pressure injuries, medication um, incidents. All right. And it should be in every member's letter of appointment. They should sign an acknowledgement to the prevention of pressure injury, slips and falls and medication errors and infection control according to the Occupational Health and Safety Act. It's a legal requirement. It should be in the letter of appointment because if you have this and you have disciplinary or performance issues, you have a legal standpoint. Very, very important. I can't um, emphasize this. Do you assess new staff when they come from another facility? How do you know they've not been on night duty for 10 years and just been left to like a mushroom? Yeah, we can all relate, hey? Deadly. I feel so sorry for those staff. We all know that they, there are staff that do night duty because of their family circumstances, and they have to. And we also know that there's staff that do night duty because that's where they hide out. So you must assess level of competence, level of knowledge. You're not saying to a new staff member, I doubt you, I don't believe in your skills. You're simply, you're wanting to, you need a baseline from where to start. 
because you're going to develop that person. You're going to engage that person. You're going to make them love their job and want to get up every day knowing that they're doing something that is science and evidence based, which is risk assessment. It's all, all the time we are assessing risk and we are scanning. But now we have the help of medical devices to, to help us. I remember the days we used to rub patients with meths. You know, that, that, that was it. So, after today, are you thinking you're going to go back and look at your risk assessment tool? Yes. On the internet, download copies of all those Braden, Norton, whatever, all right? My presentation is available on email um, from, from Megan, should you require it. Um, each of these slides is being compiled so that you can print it off as a once-off for teaching or for a notice board. But try and tailor make your, your tools. And these are the two nursing guidelines that I can thoroughly recommend. This document <coughs> was compiled by a medical aid in uh, North America for the hospitals because they were having such a high incidence of uh, pressure ulcers that the medical insurance company, this is a lovely document. And then this is the new one that I was telling you about that was published in 2020 that incorporates skin tears, moisture associated and incontinence skin damage with pressure injury prevention and management. And they, they're downloadable from the, the internet. So to conclude, this is an example of a care bundle that I was telling you about. This, is, this was coined by the um, National Health Service in the UK, but is now spreading around the world with the help of Arjo and other, other companies in terms of pressure, injury, and skin integrity uh, management. And you see, we call it the asking bundle. And you see the elements there that we've covered today. So all it is, is a mnemonic to jog your brain. That's all it is. It is not a protocol. It is not a toolkit. It is a, a brain jogger. All right. So that when you're teaching and when you're compiling your protocols and when you're doing training, these are the things that you must be, be considering. And thinking back to your Kennedy terminal ulcer that you saw at the very beginning, don't forget to keep your families and the loved ones informed. I've, I, we've just personally had a very sad experience from a hospital that really was a long-term care issue. And I feel ashamed, absolutely ashamed for the way it was managed. And this, this resident had a living will. And she had advanced dementia, Parkinson's, was blind and couldn't speak. <coughs> Craniotomy, tube feeding, you name it. Yeah. So, you know, that's when it cuts very, very close to to home. So, and those are all the, the references. Thank you all. Thank you, Helen. I don't think <laughs> Helen should ever retire. I've known you for, we worked out, 17 years. At so. least, at least. Because I started, and again, please, this is a CPD activity, so ethics is very, very important. But as a bedside nurse, as I've explained to you, um, I've worked right across. Um, I left hospital sector because I was so disillusioned and went out on my own. As I say, this is my passion is risk. Bugs are my, my passion. I'm known as the bug lady out there in the hospitals. But as I say, it was when I worked in hospice care and, I, and for NGOs and in AIDS care, there's no money. You've got to make a sow's, what's it called? A silk purse from a sow's ear. And I remember in the days, it was not Arjo, it was Huntley Health. We had this hoist. This thing was so ancient. It worked every day, 30 times a day. Every patient had a deep bubble bath every day, right into the terminal phase. It was the most wonderful thing to be able to give a resident, you know, is that immersion in the water and, and the bath. And we didn't get pressure ulcers, and we didn't get issues like that. So it is under our control. And as I say, when it comes to these medical devices, 
any sort of a, a contract is a good idea because you cannot put a value to trade the cost of training. You've got free on, you know, on-site training. The other thing is, if you've got breakdowns or upgrades, you're getting the most modern device possible. And this applies to many, many medical devices, not just interactive surfaces. So from that perspective, um, I'm a great proponent of it. Awesome, Helen, thank you. I, I would just like to, to close Helen's session. Um, you know, having a bed saw is like having a brother in jail. And everybody knows he's there, but nobody speaks about him. Yeah. And I think it's time that we start to be honest with ourselves with regards to the prevalence of pressure injuries. The amount of times we hear, we don't get pressure sores, but we get them back from hospital with pressure mm. sores. And then you speak to hospitals, and they say we get them from the old age homes. So let's face it, it is an epidemic under the sheets, okay? I encourage you guys to take pressure care as one of your primary quality improvement initiatives, okay? And I was fortunate enough to go to Sydney four years ago, and I examined their long-term care sector from a balcony view, and I was able to get a good perspective of what we need to do in South Africa, okay? 35 years ago, Australia was in such a bad state that the government had to put a plan in place to improve. They implemented the accreditation standards of which there were first four, and today there's eight, including one for person-centered support, okay? If you look at those first four accreditation standards, the first point in every standard is show quality improvement initiative. It's Pressure. non-negotiable. They will not register or give the hospital a license. Yeah. That's what Steve means by accreditation. And, and, and or pressure, the facility. Pressure injury is a science, okay? Pressure prevention is not easy, but it starts with assessment because we can't manage what we don't measure, okay? And Arjo are here to help you prevent and manage your four main extrinsic factors. Pressure, friction, shear, moisture, okay? We've got solutions to help you. And I would encourage you, when we engage with you afterwards and, and on your forms here, We've got, um, and, and this is essential, guys. You're not going to get out this door if you don't give us a form back, okay? Um, <laughs> no, there is a it, test. Is we've got quality improvement initiatives, okay? And pressure care would fall into the in-bed care area, okay? Now, I want to explain the history very quickly because I know we, we're very conscious of time. I would <laughs> say 16, 17 years ago, we started the pressure care service into hospitals. You go into your private hospitals now, they don't buy mattresses, okay? They rent mattresses. If you, as facilities, set up a business account with Arjo, okay, and we'll, we'll happily issue with a form, it's not complicated. Return the form, we set up an account for you. It is made so easy, okay? You call us, you give us your residence name. It'll cost you between 45 and 75 rand a day. My price is right. Yeah. Okay. Those of you that are part of the groups, you get a little bit more bargaining power. We've got, we've got a clinically effective surface. Okay. A mattress replacement surface, which is fully disinfected. Highly effective. No maintenance issues. No storage issues. Okay. 45 rand a day. What's your cost of a pressure injury? Yes, there's money involved, but there's mental costs, there's physical costs, there's pain, okay? So prevention is always going to be better than a cure. And I, I strongly encourage you, make that a priority. Improve the way we manage those four main extrinsic factors. And in our session, at the end of the day, we're going to be having a closer look at moving and handling of people, okay? Because we can manage friction and shear in a very easy and effective way. So, flat, flat. My story is eight. <laughs> Helen, you're a legend. Thank you yeah, for, thank, for today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, I believe we're taking another half hour break. Um, oh, the next session is going to be specialized seating, okay? Functional seating. It's going to be a, a, a virtual session.
Okay, Martina Tierney, who's a, an OT from Ireland, is going to be dialing in. And she is another wow factor. Okay, uh, we're extremely privileged to have her join us. Um, so if we can be on time, we'll set it up so that it's streaming, ready for you to come back. Let's aim to be back at quarter past. One question. Uh, you, quickly? <laughs> Only if you filled your form in. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't sell or, or produce products. As I say, I'm a risk management specialist. But the, the ingredient that I think you're referring to is urea. Urea, 3 to 5% urea. Um, and whether it's Dischem or Clix, they're not expensive. Um, but these are the kind of emollients that replace and support the sebum. Hang on a sec that you're asking me about things that replace and support the sebum barrier of the skin. Is that what you're asking about? Yes. So urea, it's a humectant. And a humectant just means it draws water um, into the skin after it's applied. So it keeps the skin supple. So it supports this barrier here. So if you've got a, a resident with diabetes, um, so obviously their foot care, I don't have to tell you, is so important, or someone who is incontinent, or someone who's got very, very dry skin, or is subject to dermatitis, um, there are dermatologically approved um, emollients that contain urea. They are pH balanced, and they will not have any coloring, I nearly said flavoring, but perfume in them. But urea, is that what your question was? Yeah. Yeah, please, if I talk about a project, it's just to give an example. Yeah. But the next time you pop an anti-inflammatory, just think about your kidneys and, yeah. Well, um, we've got business application forms here. Show of hands, who would like to take one to set up a, a rental card with us? <coughs> Let me, let me hand them to you now. Yeah. All right, uh, anybody hungry? Um. I'm not sure if there's food outside. Yeah. 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 Yeah